Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to have you here today. Whether you're joining us on our Dixon City campus or in Clark Summit or on our Wilkesbury campus, wherever you happen to be today, I'm so glad that you're with us for week number four in this series called How to Wreck Your Life. And during this series, we've been talking about some of the most common ways that people end up wrecking their lives. And the purpose of this series is perhaps to help some of you not wreck your own life. And today we're talking about the fourth way to wreck your life, which is simply this, to let your kids raise themselves. Because here's what I've discovered, and I've discovered this in my own experience, I've also discovered this in talking to other people, that one of the deepest pains in life is the pain that comes into the heart of parents when your kids begin to go astray. The pain that comes when your kids begin to make very unwise decisions or perhaps even destructive decisions. And listen, if you love your kids, then when it looks like they're going to wreck their life, and that wrecks your life as well, doesn't it? And the opposite of this is true. I think one of the greatest joys in our hearts is the joy in knowing that our kids are thriving. And I've been doing a lot of thinking about this whole parenting thing lately, and that's because my oldest daughter graduated from high school in May. Uh, Let me show you a picture. Uh, Actually, in June, she graduated. This is my daughter, Leah. Uh, And uh, Leah uh, just left home, okay? So Debbie and I, a little over a week ago, drove to Atlanta where we dropped our daughter off, and she got on a plane to go to South Africa. And she's going to be there for the next nine months. You see, she decided that before she goes off to college, uh, she wanted to spend a year serving somewhere. And so she's going to be spending... Uh, about the next nine months in South Africa working in an orphanage and a school in that place. Uh, Now, just to be clear, we did not encourage this. Uh, I didn't even know she was thinking about this until she came to me with the idea. I mean, it was totally her idea. And when we dropped her off in Atlanta and drove back home, I got to be honest with you, that was a bittersweet moment. It really was. The bitter part of it is this. We're not going to see her at Thanksgiving We're not going to see her at Christmas. She won't come back home until June 15th of next year. And we we miss her already. I mean, uh, maybe that's a good thing because if she were a rotten kid, we might be relieved that she's gone, but she's a good kid. And so we already miss her. That's the bitter part of it. The sweet part of the bittersweet is this, that she chose on her own to spend nine months serving some of the most disadvantaged children in the world. And that, I think, just says something really um, encouraging about her heart. But as we were driving home, I thought to myself, you know what, this really is a turning point in my life and in her life. This is a turning point in our relationship with each other because I'm still her dad. But from now on, my day-to-day responsibilities of parenting her Those days are over because she has now gained her independence and she is on her own. And as I thought about that, I realized that that goodbye in Atlanta, that was the whole point of the last 19 years of parenting. That everything that Debbie and I had done for the last 19 years of raising our daughter was to lead up to that moment, to that point when we would let her go. In fact, I would summarize the whole point of parenting in one simple statement. Here's what we do as parents, or at least what we need to do. We need to set them up for the day when we see them off. In other words, we can't live our children's lives for them. All we can do is try to give them the tools to live life well, because there comes a time when our kids grow up, and they leave home, and they begin to make their own decisions And we have this little window of time of 18, 19, 20 years to do that. And the question is, how do we do that? How do we make decisions that will set our kids up to make their own decisions once we see them off? Now, that's what we're going to talk about today. But... Before we jump in, there are just three things that I need to say right up front, three kind of disclaimers, I guess they would be. And the first one is this, I'm not an expert on parenting, okay? I just want to say that right up front. In fact, if you don't believe me, just ask my kids. In fact, this is a subject that I don't even teach on very often uh, because I just don't feel that I've done the best job I could possibly do as a parent. It's only by God's grace that our kids maybe uh, will turn out halfway decent. In fact, I identify a lot with Charlie Shedd. Charlie Shedd 
uh, is a motivational speaker, and he tells a story about himself, uh, and he says this. He said, before Martha and I had kids, I used to travel all across the country giving a lecture that I called the Ten Commandments for Raising Perfect Kids. After having our first child, I changed the title to Ten Guidelines for Raising Good Kids. After our second child came along, I retitled the lecture again, calling it Ten Suggestions for Fellow Strugglers. By our third child, I had shortened the lecture and was calling it Five Tips for Surviving Parenthood. Eventually, I stopped speaking on the subject altogether. I identify with that because I know this, that I am not an expert on parenting, and that's okay because I'm not here today uh, to give my advice about parenting. My hope is simply to point your attention to the incredible wisdom of Scripture that addresses this subject. The second thing I need to say right up front is this, that many of you are already doing a great job. And I just want to acknowledge that because when you're a, a parent, there can be fear and insecurity that begins to creep into your heart. And you begin to wonder, you know, am I doing the right things? Uh, you know, am I doing enough of the right things? Or are my kids going to end up in front of a therapist someday talking about me? And there's a lot of fear and insecurity that can come with parenting sometimes, especially if you love your kids and want to do that well. So I just want to acknowledge that we've got a lot of parents in this church who are already doing a great job. And maybe for some of you today, what I talk about is just going to be review and reminder. In fact, the very fact that you're here today and your kids are with you, you're already way ahead of the game. Third thing I need to say is this, though, and perhaps most importantly, this isn't a message just for parents. Because this church, Parker Hill, is a very diverse church, and I know that not everybody hearing this message is parenting kids right now. So I want to say right up front that this isn't a message for, just for parents. In fact, that is not the case at all. Because here's what you need to understand. You may not have kids in your home, but all of us have kids in our lives. We do. And many of you, perhaps all of us, if we look for it, we have the opportunity to influence the next generation. Some of you will do that as grandparents or maybe as an aunt or uncle. Some of you can do that as a coach, as a mentor, as a next-door neighbor. Many of you are doing that right now. You're influencing the next generation because you volunteer in some way in our family ministries. And we just need more of you to do that, as a matter of fact. And I say this, this isn't a message just for parents, because I think we need to realize that one of our highest priorities as a church, not just parents, but as a church collectively, one of our highest priorities needs to be to pass on our faith and our values to the next generation. In fact, let me show you a number. 899. 899 is the number of kids and students that walk through the doors of one of our campuses during the month of September. From birth through high school. Now, some of these 899 just came once during the month of September. Some of the 899 were there every week. But during the month of September, 899 unique individuals, birth through high school, that walked through the doors of one of our buildings and engaged in our family ministries. Do you know what this means? Do you know what this represents? This represents for us as a church a tremendous opportunity and a huge responsibility. We have the responsibility and the opportunity to pour into the hearts of, I'll just say 900, because we probably missed one somewhere along the way, 900 kids last month. 900 kids to change a generation. And I believe that all of us, not just parents, all of us need to feel the weight of this number because we are all members of the same spiritual family. And we all have a collective responsibility. And so you may not be a parent right now, but you do have influence. And we need you to exercise that influence. Because here's what we need to do for those 899 kids and many that will follow them. We need to set them up for the day that we see them off. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Well, every week during this series, we've been looking into one book of the Bible for wisdom. And that is the book of Proverbs and the book of Proverbs is simply a collection of wise sayings about how to do life from God's perspective. And Proverbs has so much to say about how we invest in the next generation. And in fact, there's so much to say about this subject, we could probably spend six weeks on this subject alone. 
Uh, but obviously we're not going to do that. So I just want to focus on three big ideas right here, okay? Three things that I think we need to do as parents and as a church if we're going to set up our kids for the day when we see them off. Number one is this. We need to inspire them with a compelling vision. In other words, we need to paint a picture for our kids of what God might be able to do in them and through them in this world. And this is a theme that you see in the book of Proverbs. In fact, in Proverbs, there's a two-word phrase that comes up over and over again. It's this simple two-word phrase, my son. That's because Proverbs was written or compiled, actually, by a father for his son, by Solomon for his son, Rehoboam. And he was giving him an instruction book for life, God's wisdom on how to do life. And so 24 times in Proverbs, you find this little phrase, my son, including here in chapter 3, where he says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. And I love this. This is a dad speaking spiritual truth into the heart of his son. This is not a dad who says, well, they'll take care of that at church. This is not a dad who says, well, your mama will talk to you about that. No, this is a dad who's pouring spiritual truth into the heart of his son. And he goes on to say this in verse 3. He says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And here's the picture of his future. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Do you see what this father is doing He's painting a picture of the vision that he has for his son. He's saying, son, I want you to grow up to be a man of favor. I want you to grow up to be a man who has a good name, first of all, in the sight of God, but secondly, also in the sight of other people. And let me tell you something. We need to do the same thing. We need to paint a compelling picture for our kids of what could be and what should be as God works through their hearts. Because I believe that our words have power. And I believe that our kids will try to live up to what we believe about them. And so we must speak to their potential. We must invite them to dream the dreams that God may have for them. We must tell our kids that God is writing a bigger story in this world and that God has a part for them to play in that story. We've got to inspire them with a compelling vision. I was in a meeting a few weeks ago. And it was a meeting for parents of high school and middle school students in our church. And uh, since I'm a parent, I was there in the meeting as well. But one of our student ministry pastors read a statement that I thought was just so powerful that I asked the guys to email it to me. And this is their vision for our students. Just listen to this. We believe your kids are not the church of tomorrow, but they are the church of today. We believe your kids have the potential to be game changers in their schools, on their sports teams, in their dance classes, online, and in their neighborhoods. We believe every kid is made in the image of God and that every one matters to him. We believe it's not our job to reach the next generation. We believe it's our job to raise up leaders to reach their own generation. Man, that is a compelling and inspiring vision right there. And can I tell you that I think one of the greatest tragedies that I see in the church today is that so many parents, so many Christian parents, settle for such a small vision for their kids. In fact, let me just give you three examples of an inferior vision for our kids. Here's the first one, making the grade. You know, I meet some parents who I get the sense that their vision for their kids could be summarized this way. I want to make sure my kids get a good education. And so they're, they're prepping them for the SAT in fifth grade, and they're taking a foreign language class in preschool because it's all about making the grade. Now, please don't misunderstand me. There's nothing wrong with, with impressing upon your kids the need for a good education. My wife is a school teacher by profession. We believe in the importance of a good education. I've got the report cards to prove it. And I believe our kids need to work hard at school. That's a character issue. But here's the thing. The greatest and highest goal for our kids is not that they will be smart. 
the greatest and highest goal for our kids if we are followers of Christ is that they will love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, love their neighbor as themselves, themselves, and make a difference in this world. That's the vision. That's the goal. The second inferior goal I see is this, what I would call making the team, making the team. Now, let me just warn you, in the next three minutes, I'm going to say some things that will tempt some of you to want to send me an email to try to set me straight. Let me just encourage you not to bother doing that. Here's what I mean by making the team. I see families, Christian families, who will forsake God for months at a time and keep their 12-year-old out of church so that he can play on a team so that maybe he can win a trophy that will sit in the attic and collect dust. And then we wonder why little Johnny walks away from his faith when he's in college and walks away from his wife when he's in his 40s. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that sports are bad. Sports are great. Go ahead and play and have a great time. But remember, athletic success is not the primary goal for our kids. The primary goal for our kids is that they would have an authentic relationship with their Heavenly Father and make a difference in this world. And anything that gets in the way of that is an idol. And I just think there are lots of parents who are trying to find glory vicariously through their kids. I'm sorry if that bothers you. And here's what, here's what some of you might be thinking right now. Some of you are thinking, but Mark, see, you don't understand because your kids dance. They don't play sports. You don't understand. Team sports are essential for kids because they build character. Okay. If that's true, then the men with the greatest character in the United States of America would all be in the NBA, the NFL, and Major League Baseball. And think about it. What about poor guys like Abraham Lincoln who had no team sports to help them build character? Imagine what a great leader he would have been if only he had had travel soccer. Now, I know I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but here's my point. Physical activity is great. We need to take care of our bodies. I'm all for that. But the idea that our schedules and our lives should revolve around sports, that's a pagan concept. That's not the vision for your kids. Making the grade, making the team. Here's a third inferior vision, making the money. Because here's what our culture tells us. Our culture tells us the most important thing we can do is to make sure our kids get good grades so they can be accepted into the best colleges, choose the most lucrative career, and do better than we did meaning having a higher income than we have ourselves. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with success. I hope your kids succeed. I hope they make lots of money, and they're very generous with it. But the highest goal for our kids is not material success. The greatest goal for our kids is that they would have an authentic relationship with their Heavenly Father and that they would make a difference in this world. See, we need to raise a generation of young people who have a vision that is more inspiring than making the grade, making the team, or making the money. We want to raise a generation of kids around here who make a difference in a desperately, desperately broken world. We've got to inspire them with a compelling vision. Here's the second thing that we need to do if we're going to set them up for when we see them off. We've got to shape our kids with loving discipline. And this theme comes up over and over again in the book of Proverbs. Like in chapter 19, here's just one example. It says, discipline your children, for in that there is hope. And it says this, do not be a willing party to their death. In other words, a lack of loving discipline could potentially lead to the death of your child. I mean, that is a stark statement. But Proverbs even goes on to point out the fact that God himself is the ultimate example of loving discipline. In chapter 3, it says this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, for, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, meaning a good father, the son he delights in. And so we need to shape our kids with loving discipline. And I use the phrase loving discipline very intentionally because I've discovered as a parent that I can easily drift toward one of two extremes. The one extreme I tend to drift to sometimes is this, discipline without love, which is where we discipline our kids, but we fail to express any tenderness or compassion. And oftentimes that happens because the discipline is coming out of a heart of anger within us. But, but don't do this, and I'll tell you why you shouldn't do this. Because rules without relationship 
always lead to rebellion. Rules without relationship always lead to rebellion. That's one extreme, discipline without love. The other extreme is this, love without discipline. This is where we have no boundaries for our kids because we think that's the loving thing to do. That's why I put love in, in, in quotation marks. But that's not love. That's just permissiveness. So we've got to give loving discipline. Now, how do we do that? How do we provide that for our kids? Well, there, there are entire books written about how to, how to raise your kids and discipline them and create boundaries for them, and hey, you can read entire books on that. Let me just give you two things that I have found helpful in my own life and, and what I've heard from other people is helpful as well. First thing you can do is this. Reward what's right more often than you reprimand what's wrong. In other words, you catch your kids doing the right things, and you affirm that, and you reward that, and you tell them you appreciate that. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what's hard about this. This takes more thought and more attention than just reprimanding your kids. Just reprimanding your kids is, is easier. This takes a little more work, but it's so powerful. I think rewarding what's right is far more powerful than punishing and reprimanding what's wrong. Second thing you can do is this, if you want to be loving in your discipline, would be to give consistent consequences, not empty threats. See, it seems like to me that there's a common form of parenting these days that involves threatening and yelling, but never actually doing anything. And, and let, me, let me give you a picture of what that looks like, at least to me sometimes. Uh, Debbie and I, when we first got married, we moved into an apartment that was directly across the street from a, a fire department. And whenever that fire alarm went off, it would literally rattle the stuff in our kitchen cabinets, the dishes. I mean, it was like crazy loud. But do you know what happened after we lived there for about, about a month? We got used to it. We didn't even notice it anymore. We, we would sleep right through it. We kind of forgot it was there. And then every once in a while, we would have company come over. And we'd have our company there, and the fire alarm would go off while they were there. And they would just jump out of their skin and they would say, how can you live like this? And I'm like, what do you mean, live like what? Oh, the fire alarm, that's right. There are parents like that, I think. There are some parents that, that, that they just kind of go off and they're really loud. But guess what their kids eventually figure out they can do? They, they kind of learn to ignore them. And they say to themselves, oh, that's just mom. She'll quiet down in a minute and kind of go on with life. See, what our kids need is consistent consequences, not empty threats. In other words, that's where you say, honey, this is a standard I have for you. This is a boundary I have for you. If you don't meet the standard, if you cross the boundary, these will be the consequences. And the consequences need to be proportionate, and they need to be fair, and they need to make sense. But you say, if you, if you do that, these will be the consequences because I love you. And, and then you apply the consequences consistently. I'll give you one example. I read about a dad who had a teenage daughter, and whenever she would get angry, which was kind of a lot, she would slam the door in her bedroom, just slam it. And uh, he would tell her, he would say, honey, I know you're angry, but you can't slam the door. Don't slam the door. She kept slamming it. And he said, finally, he said, honey, listen, it's not appropriate for you to slam your door. So if you slam it again, you will lose your door, okay? And she's like, oh, come on, dad. And, of course, you know, the next day she gets mad and she slams the door. And so he got a screwdriver, took the door off its hinges, put it in storage, and for three weeks she had no door in her bedroom. She had to change clothes in the bathroom. Never slammed her door again. That's just consistent consequences. So how do we set our kids up for when, when we're going to see them off? We, we uh, inspire them with a compelling vision. We shape them with loving discipline. Third thing is this, so important. We surround them with the right influences. Because here's what you need to know about raising kids if you're a parent. You will be a primary influence in your kids' lives. You will not be the only influence in your kids' lives. And wise parents are very intentional about being the subtle architects of their kids' relational world. Uh, two weeks ago in this series, we talked all about the importance of friendships and choosing them well. And we looked at a whole bunch of verses here in the book of Proverbs. Let me go back and just revisit two of them. Chapter 27, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, 
So one person sharpens another, assuming that the person that's sharpening you is pretty sharp, him or herself. Then chapter 13, verse 20, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harms. In other words, if your kids hang out with the wise, they're going to absorb wisdom. If they hang out with fools, they're going to pay the price and suffer for it. And so the question is this, how do we help our kids surround themselves with the right influences so that that will set them up for the day when we see them off? This is a very, very practical message, this message is, and and I want to get very, very practical here on this point as well. I want to tell you two things that you can do very practically to surround your kids with the right influences. Number one is this, create a network of like-minded parents and do life together. Listen, if you're a new parent or if you're planning to become a parent someday, here's something you can do, and you, you, you need to do this when your kids are very young. And and this will be so important. Here's what you do. You find four or five other families who share your faith and your values and and who have kids about the same age as your kids and you just kind of hang out together and you do life together. And I'll tell you what, Debbie and I have been very, very blessed. We've raised our kids here in this, this one area, this church, and we have been so blessed to have a network of friends who are part of our lives, part of this church. And over time, our kids have just become friends. And we didn't sit down with our girls and say, listen, girls, these are your assigned friends, whether you like it or not. You know, of course we didn't do that. We just all spent time together, and eventually these relationships formed naturally. In fact, I'll give you an example of that. We, we, uh, every Father's Day weekend, we have a group of friends that we go camping with. We, we've done this since our kids were very, very small, like for 15 years. Let me show you a picture. This is one of the early years right here. All the kids lined up for a picture. Man, I I almost cried just looking at that. Here's seven years later. And there were families that would move away and we'd add other families in or their kids would graduate. And and so the group changed subtly over the years. So then then last summer, summer 2014, this is the group here. And we, we, we have this tradition on Father's Day, on Sunday, we would have our own little worship service there and uh, we would just read some scripture together and, and we would talk about it and maybe sing a couple of songs. And then all the dads, we, we gather around the kids in the middle of the circle and we, we join hands and we just pray for our kids and we pray for their hearts and we pray for their future. And every Father's Day to me is just a reminder that you know what, I'm not doing this parenting thing alone that I'm able to raise my kids in relationship with other families who share my values and that they love my kids almost as much as I do and that we've surrounded ourselves with each other because we know the power of influence. So number one, create a network of like-minded parents and do life together. Number two is this, prioritize consistent involvement in the life of a healthy church. Let me define healthy church. In my opinion, a healthy church is a church that is true to the message of Scripture and is also relevant and engaging to the next generation. Because you can take your kids to a church that's relevant to people my age and older, but that may not be what keeps them grounded in the faith beyond high school. You need to engage them in a healthy church that's true to Scripture, but also relevant and engaging for kids. And I tell people all the time, you know, even if I didn't work here, I'd come to church here. I would, because I love this church. And one of the reasons I love this church is because of the impact that it has made on the lives of my kids. I am the greatest cheerleader for our family ministry staff and volunteer and volunteers. And I got to tell you, the thing that has really impacted the lives of my kids about this church is not sitting in this room listening to me. They can listen to me anytime. There are two things that have really been catalysts for change in the lives of my kids. Number one is this, their small group. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, The way we structure our programming for kids and students, it works this way. There's a large group time where they're all together for singing and worship and hearing some teaching. And then after the large group time, they break into small groups with their small group leaders where they kind of unpack the truth that they've heard that day and how they apply it to their lives. And what happens over a period of time is that our kids not only build relationships with other kids, but they also build relationships with their small group leaders. And many of those leaders travel with those kids from second grade to third grade to fourth grade, sometimes for years. And those small group leaders become mentors 
to those kids. And I got to tell you, for Debbie and I, it's been such a huge blessing to have small group leaders involved in the lives of our kids, reinforcing what we tell our kids. And, and I think of um, Stephanie and Molly and Marisa and Tammy and Nardamar and Jamie and another Stephanie and probably a few other names that I've forgotten. Young women who came alongside my daughters and poured into them and helped them to become the young women that they are becoming. And I got to tell you, there have been times when my kids will be talking to me and they'll tell me something that they learned from their small group leader that they, they, they heard from their small group leader, and I'll hear them say that, and then I'll say this to myself, and I won't say it out loud. I'll just say it to myself. I'll say, oh, my goodness, I've been trying to tell you that for years, right? But he, I don't say that with resentment. I say that with gratitude because here's what I know, that my kids need to hear the truth from people other than me sometimes, And so I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the hundreds of volunteers who serve not only my kids and pour into the hearts of my kids, but also the other 897 kids that are part of this church. In fact, on every campus right now, I just want us to show our appreciation for all of our Family Ministries volunteers. Let's do that. Thank you. All right, and in that same fashion on that same note here's the second thing that has really impacted my kids in in the church here it's not sitting in this room the other thing has been their serving opportunities and here's what I mean by that I've always required my kids to do the very same thing that that we ask all of you to do which is to find a place to use their gifts and abilities to advance God's kingdom and to serve others that's always been non-negotiable in our family not because I'm a pastor but because I believe that's a biblical mandate for every Christian. Because I believe that a non-serving Christian is a walking contradiction. And so my kids serve. And when they became old enough, they started leading small groups in our children's ministry so that they could pour into the lives of other kids what had been poured into them. In fact, let me show you a picture. This is my daughter Leah, who's now in South Africa, baptizing one of the kids in her first grade small group. She baptized two kids that night. Let me tell you, and I keep this picture on the wall in my office because that's a day that she will never forget that was formative in her life, serving someone else. It has changed my kids. And parents, let me just encourage you to do this. Find a place to serve. Invite your kids to serve alongside of you. You want to build character in your kids? You don't need a travel soccer team. You just worship one hour, then hang around and serve the next hour or serve and then worship. Because here's the thing, you will make a decision about what you're going to prioritize in your life. You will prioritize something, and I believe one of the best things you can do for your kids, if you want to set them up for when you see them off, is you prioritize consistent involvement in the life of a healthy church. It'll change them. It'll surround them with the right influences. In fact, let me just plug one more an opportunity, one more time, an opportunity for that, and that's our fall retreat coming up this coming weekend for middle school and high school students. We have 140 some already signed up. If you have a middle school student or a high school student who is not yet signed up for the fall retreat, you've got 24 hours to do that. You need to make that happen. You say, well, I asked my kids and they didn't want to go. Let me ask you a question. Do your kids ever not want to go to school in the morning? Probably. If you can't afford it, let me know. I'll help you. But that's coming up. Make that a priority because what you want to do is you want to surround your kids with the right influences, and you need to be intentional about that. Let me tell you why you need to be intentional about that. We have parents who come to us when their kids are in high school, junior or senior in high school maybe, and their kids have begun to take a path that's leading them in a bad direction, making really bad moral and spiritual choices. And in the discussion sometimes, here's what we discover. We discover that their parents have never really made it a priority to have their kids invested in the life of a healthy church. And and they come to us and they're very concerned, sometimes distraught, and they say, how do we turn this around? You know, can you help us? And to be honest, at that point, it's about 10 years too late. It really is. I love what a pastor from California said one time. He said this, if you don't make a habit of being involved in your church every week, you shoot yourself in the foot, your children in the leg, and your grandchildren in the heart. So how do we set our kids up for the day when we see them off? 
Inspire them with a compelling vision. Train them with loving discipline. Surround them with the right influences. Now, before I wrap up, let me just give you a reality check. I want to tell you this. There are no guarantees. In fact, the very same book of the Bible that gives us this incredible wisdom about raising our kids also tells us that there's no guarantees, even if we do everything right. Proverbs 13.1 says this. It says, a wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a mocker does not respond to rebukes. And that may be your child. Proverbs 30 says this, there are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. In other words, it is entirely possible that even in the very best home with the most dedicated parents, there's a possibility that your kids will still reject you and and your values and walk away from everything that you've taught them for two reasons. Every human being is born with a sin nature and born with a free will. And I know this, I know that I've got to do my very best as a dad with my kids to love them and train them and nurture them. But ultimately, ultimately, their future is in the hands of God. And if your kids have rebelled and they've walked away and they've kind of wrecked their lives, let me just say this to you, a word of encouragement. God knows how you feel because he has lots of rebellious children. He understands that. So before I wrap up, let me just give you one resource If you're in the thick of it, especially if you're parenting young kids, I would encourage you to read right now, as soon as you can, this book by Reggie Joyner and Carrie Newhoff. It's called Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. One of the best books I've ever seen on how to parent well. But here's our job. If we're parents, here's our job, even just as a church. When it comes to the next generation, we need to set them up for the day that we see them off. And we've got to have a sense of urgency about this. And here's why we have to have a sense of urgency. Because time passes so quickly. And I know that sounds like a cliche, but I know it's true as well. You know, a few times of year, a few times a year, we do uh, a baby dedication ceremony around here uh, for new parents in our church. And as a part of that ceremony, we give out a jar of marbles that looks like this to every family who's a part of that baby dedication ceremony. Inside this jar are 936 marbles representing the 936 weeks you have with your son or daughter from birth until high school graduation. 936 weeks. And here's what we tell parents to do. We tell them that every week you go to this jar, you take out one marble, and you throw it away to represent the fact that time is moving and you only have so much time. For my oldest daughter, this is what the jar looks like. The time has come, and the time has gone. Here's the point. My point is this. If you're a parent, you will will eventually lose all your marbles, okay? (laughs) That's the point. No, the point is this. Your kids will grow up. It'll happen faster than you think. They will move away. They will gain their independence. How are you going to prepare for that? We were driving home from Atlanta, and I'll tell you what, the one question that kept coming back to my mind was this question, is she ready? Did we do everything we could do? Did we do enough to prepare her? Is she really ready for this? And here's what I wanna tell you, when we launch our kids out into life, we can give them a lot of things. But the most important thing we can give them is an authentic relationship with their Heavenly Father. Because you can't be there for your kids the rest of their, their life. You can't be there for them Uh, At some point, you won't be here anymore. But listen, if they have an authentic relationship with their Heavenly Father, He will be there for them. He will comfort them. He will guide them. He will be the anchor for their souls. And that's the most important thing we can give our kids, an authentic relationship with their Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ before we see them off. I want you to stay seated on every campus Uh, We're going to sing one more song. I want you to stay for that. And then our our campus pastor on every campus is going to come and just close in prayer for the next generation.